Let's go to the Lord once again in prayer. Father in heaven, thank you for this time in your word. Thank you that your word is living and powerful. Thank you that it effectually works in the lives of those who believe that it is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. That it is Christ's word to us, coming to us, strengthening us, enabling us, telling us about you, your greatness and your glory and your majesty. As we hear it, we pray, Lord, it soak into our minds and hearts and change us for Christ's call. In his name we pray, amen. This morning, we are coming to this final dimension of sin. And this particular dimension of sin, unlike the other aspects or dimensions of sin, speaks to something that is certainly an aspect of sin, and that is that there is a way it can be defeated. This dimension of sin is the defeat of sin. But before we examine it, I want to remind you of the first nine dimensions of sin we have seen. Very important that we understand these dimensions because of minimization of these dimensions of sin, as you will see momentarily, will result inevitably in a minimization of the defeat of sin in your thinking. You'll recall the fact that according to Scripture, sin is diabolical. It has Satan as its origin. We could say it has Satan as, it is, as its origin and the heart of fallen man as its seat. We'll see that later. We're not going to elaborate on every one of the verses listed for each of these because we have spent considerable time, weeks now, doing that. But we'll acknowledge the fact that sin is defined in Scripture. Sin is not left up to man to define. God defined it in his word. Sin is directional. And that sin is directional sin, all sin, every sin, those sins we call small sins, those sins we refer to as great sins, they're all directed against one person, against God himself. That doesn't mean that sin doesn't affect the lives of people, and it doesn't mean that sin doesn't affect the lives of those that are sinned, that sin thrusts into turmoil. But it does communicate the fact that ultimately all sin is aimed at God. It's all directional. As David said, against you, and you only have I sin. Sin is diffusive in that it spreads out and affects and infects everything that it touches. It permeates to the very core of humanity. Every single individual is conceived in sin. As again, David said in that same psalm, Psalm 51, I was conceived in sin. Sin is divisive. It separates people from God and people from people. Ultimately, though, it separates us from God. And the separation from God results in a separation from people who are made in the image of God. Sin is domineering. It is a master over those in its dominion. It is a cruel taskmaster. The Bible tells us clearly in the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, whoever commits sin 
Whoever therefore in that verse and the meaning of the word commit, whoever keeps on sinning, that person in whom the power of sin has not been broken, that person, Jesus said, is a slave to sin. Slave to sin. Sin is deceitful, as we have seen. Those very individuals in John 8 that Jesus was speaking to, those people, whenever they heard Jesus say those words, whoever commits sin is a slave to sin, immediately responded to Christ and said, we are Abraham's children and have never been in bondage to any man. They exemplified the deceitfulness of sin. They had been in bondage to men. Historically, and even presently when they, those words were on their tongue, they were in the process of being subjugated to Roman rule, to the Roman Empire. Sin had deceived them. Hebrews chapter 3 makes it clear. In verse 13, sin is deceitful. The deceitfulness of sin, the text says. Sin, according to Romans 6.23, is destructive. And we can look at all the ways that sin is destructive, but as we saw, the ultimate result of sin, as 6.23 of Romans says, is death. Death. Death is that, physical death is that ultimate destruction. And then we saw that there was a second aspect of death, and we saw that last week, that sin is damning. And that speaks to the second death, that death wherein a person is cast, according to Rome or Revelation 20, into the lake of fire that burns forever and ever. They are subjected to the eternal judgment of God. Why? Because they are undelivered sinners. Sin is damning. Sin is damning. Whenever God spoke in Genesis chapter 4 to the first conceived man, to the first man who was to be conceived with a fallen nature, to the first man who would commit murder eventually, God warned him of sin. He told Cain in Genesis chapter 4, verse 7, that sin was crouching at his door. Sin, he said, was crouching. God, in that phrase, communicated to Cain that insidious nature of sin. It's crouching. It's, it's like an animal. And he said, it's at your door. And the importance of that is that sin's relation to Cain was that it was imminent. It wasn't out there someplace. It was at his door. It was there. It was with him. And then he said, its desire is for you. And that speaks to sin's intent. God warned him. He told him about the nature of sin. And whenever we have a more full understanding of sin, we will be able to see even brighter the glory of God's grace. And that's exactly what God says. Take a look in your Bibles before we come to this particular dimension of sin, sin's defeat, and look there with me to Romans chapter 3. And notice what Paul says here in verse 5. But if... Our unrighteousness 
demonstrates the righteousness of God. What was he saying? He was saying that our unrighteousness, those who have been forgiven, is instrumental in demonstrating the righteousness of God. Against the backdrop of our unrighteousness, God's righteousness is demonstrated. You see a very similar statement in Romans chapter 5, and move down to a familiar text, verse 8. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God, against the backdrop of our black, hideous, insidious sin, sent Jesus Christ to die on the cross, and in doing so, demonstrated his love. Now, some will immediately jump to the conclusion, as Paul eventually will communicate here in chapter 5, well, if that is true, then why not go ahead and sin the more and demonstrate the glory of God the more? What did Paul say in Romans 6? What shall we say then? Verse 1, are we to continue in sin that grace may abound or increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Paul is simply making the point in chapter 3, verse 5, and 5, verse 8, that God has ordained the reality of sin and decreed its existence. So against that backdrop to fallen humanity, and in particular to those he saves, he can demonstrate some aspects, many aspects of his great being and nature, his grace, his love, his mercy, the triune God and their work. This is nothing new in the New Testament. As a matter of fact, took, take a look over a couple of chapters to Romans 9 for a moment. There is a personification of this very truth played out many times, but one in particular in the Old Testament. Look in Romans 9 with me, down in the text to verse 17. For well, the Scripture says to Pharaoh, and so what Paul's about to do in verse 17 is quote from the Old Testament, and he's quoting from the book of Exodus. And he says, as he's quoting Exodus 9.16, for this purpose, I raised you up. He says to Pharaoh, for this purpose, I raised you up. Now, if you go back and don't do it now for the sake of time, and you look in the book of Exodus, verse chapter 9 and verse 16, you'll see in that context that God sent Moses to Pharaoh, and he said to Pharaoh, say these things to Pharaoh. Now, what was one of the things that he said right here? It's quoted. For this very purpose, I raised you up to demonstrate my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed throughout the whole earth. God raised up that wicked Pharaoh. And whenever he raised that wicked man up and that wicked empire at the time, the Egyptian empire, and that empire and that man enslaved God's children by God's decree, and God delivered them from that man's great power. God demonstrated his glory. What a praise and what a blessing. So we come to sin. And by the way, just a little parenthetical note here. The deliverance from Egypt was dramatic. 
You know the plagues that led up to the deliverance. You know the final deliverance. And you know the, the crashing in of the waves on the Egyptian army as the Israelites were carried safely across on dry land. You know all of that. But what did Israel do after they got across eventually? What did they do? They forgot the misery the blackness, the vileness, the suffering under Egypt. And what did they say? They longed for the leeks, didn't they? What did they forget? They forgot all of the dimensions that they experienced under the hand, the oppression of Pharaoh and the Egyptians. That's why it's important, especially among Christians, that we go back and we recognize, as we have looked at, these various dimensions of sin. Because to the extent that we minimize them, its diabolical origin, its definitions, its direction, its diffusive dimension, its divisive dimension, its domineering, deceitful, destructive, and damning aspects, we will inevitably minimize the defeat of it. It just follows suit. Because sin's deceitful. So we come to this final dimension today. Sin is defeated. So what I would like to do this morning is look at a specific text. There are many that communicate the destruction, the defeat of sin. And then we're going to take and go back and look at each one of these dimensions of sin and see how Christ himself has defeated each of them in and for his people. So let's begin in Romans chapter 8. And see here this text, among many in Scripture, but this one in particular, that communicates the defeat of sin. Romans 8, let's start in verse 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. And here's our text. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. Then in verse 4, so that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Our text in particular is verse 3. And very specifically in that text, you note that it is stated the law could not do something. That is, it could not condemn sin because it was weak, not in and of itself, but because of the flesh. And the idea of condemning here, certainly the law condemns it in the sense that it says that it is wrong and against God. But the, the idea of condemned, as we'll see here in this text, is the destruction of something. It's the defeat of something. That is in view. The law could not defeat sin because of the flesh. The law was sent, according to Romans chapter 3, verse 20, to bring us the knowledge of sin. Through the law, the text says, comes the awareness of sin, the knowledge of sin. It didn't defeat it, it showed that people are sinners. But sin has been defeated. And notice the text. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, and notice this very first phrase, God did. God did. So start right there. God did it. God has defeated sin. Humanity did not defeat it. Humanity cannot defeat it. We are the sinners. We are held captive in its bondage until we are delivered. But God defeated it. 
God did it. The Bible tells us time after time after time in the Old Testament that salvation is of the Lord. And what is salvation from but from sin? Its power, its penalty, its presence, and all of these different dimensions. God is the Savior. Salvation is of the Lord. So Paul says what the law couldn't do, the idea there is that through your keeping of the law, you can't be delivered from sin because you can't keep the law because the law is always telling you, always saying to us, you're a sinner. And it demonstrates that we are clearly. For we have broken his law. But God did, he said. God did. What the law could not do, and what you cannot do, God did. God did. Now there are five things that it, the text immediately tells us that God did. That are actually communicated of how he brought the defeat of sin right here in this text. First of all, notice it. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did, here's the first, sending his own son. God sent his son. So, God's defeat of sin is going to be carried out, it's going to be accomplished, or has been carried out, and has been accomplished through the Son, who is, as you know, also God in nature. And, as this text clearly says, man in nature. That's why the Bible tells us again in 2 Corinthians 5 that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. God did. How did he do it? How did he defeat? How did he condemn sin? Notice it says he sent his son. He sent his son. And notice how he sent him. In the likeness of sinful flesh. He made him a man. He came in a human body. It speaks here to the incarnation of Christ. God, the Word, became flesh and dwelt among us, as John 1 says. God sent His Son. His Son took on the form of humanity. He was sinless, but He was absolutely human in nature and in physical body. And what did God send him for? Take a look at the text. As an offering for sin. As an offering for sin. Obviously, the text, and it can be translated, he sent him for sin. And it would be understood in the context of the Old Testament that speaks of the sin offering. God sent His Son as an offering for sin. He's the sin offering. That speaks to His crucifixion, His death. And in His death, what did He accomplish? Take a look at the text. He condemned sin. He condemned sin. The idea of condemned there speaks of not only sentencing, but the execution as well. They're both brought together here. The Bible uses that same word over in 2 Peter chapter 2 to speak of the condemnation of Sodom. Take a look at the text with me, 2 Peter, and go to chapter 2. And move down in the text to verse 6. And if he, and the idea is since he, 
condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to destruction, reducing them to ashes, having made them an example to those who would live ungodly lives thereafter. He condemned them. He sentenced the cities and he destroyed them. That's the idea that's communicated here back in Romans chapter 8 with regard, however, in this case, to sin. He condemned sin in the death of Christ. He brought about its defeat in Christ's death. To the extent, notice this, in the flesh. It could also be translated and is translated elsewhere in the flesh of man. And the idea there is that the death of Christ on the cross condemns sin to the extent that it even dealt with the very nature of it as it exists in humanity. What a praise. What a blessing. You see, if it didn't extend to that degree, we could never be forgiven. He hid it at the core of its existence in humanity. And this verse speaks to our justification. As is clearly communicated in verse 1, how thorough was it? Well, it's this thorough. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And so the verses that follow, verse 2 and verse 3, explain that. Why? Because Christ condemns sin. Because God did that in His Son. And for that reason, there's now no more condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. But the text and the context also speaks to sanctification, and that's communicated in the very next verse, verse 4. And take a look at the text. So that the requirement of the law, and what is it that the, re the law required? It required perfection. Might be fulfilled in us. Not might in the sense of possibly but might in the sense of an instrumental cause. That it is through Christ and through his death and the condemnation of sin in his death that the righteous requirement of the law has been met on our behalf as Christians because of Christ who walk according, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So God, in Christ, has condemned, He has defeated sin. Sin's defeated. Now I know immediately people began to think, well, if, if sin's defeated, why is it still here? Well, we know that God has a process by which He is working things out in the practical world. But for now, we can recognize that the death of Christ has brought the condemnation, the defeat, the destruction of sin. Look at these several parts, several dimensions of sin we've already examined. And with that, consider these facts associated with it, all stemming from the death of Jesus Christ. Sin, we saw first, is diabolical. Notice John chapter 12 with me. Verse 31. John 12 and 31. We'll be looking at several verses. And we need to do this so that, that you can see that these truths are from God's Word. These aren't the things that men have made. This is God's Word. This is what He has said concerning the defeat of sin and the various dimensions of it. And He has accomplished that through Christ. John chapter 12 and verse 31. 
Now judgment is upon this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. That is Satan. It is on the basis of the death of Christ that Satan is cast out. Move from here again in John to chapter 16 and verse 11. And concerning judgment, speaking of the convicting work of the Holy Spirit, because the ruler of this world has been judged, the ruler of the world is Satan, and he has been judged in Jesus Christ. Now, he's yet to be, I mentioned to you, there's a process. He is judged. He's still at loose. He's still at large. There will be a time where he will be cast into the lake of fires we read last week in Revelation chapter 20. He's serving God's purpose even now, though. Move from here to the book of Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. Move down in Hebrews 2 to verse 14. Hebrews 2.14, Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same. Remember Romans chapter 8, verse 3? God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. Speaking of the incarnation, here again the writer of Hebrews is speaking of the incarnation. He himself likewise, in verse 14, also partook of the same, that is flesh and blood, that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, and if you haven't got it yet, here it is. That is the devil. That is the devil. Praise the Lord. The very origin of sin, Satan himself has been, through the death of Christ, rendered powerless in the lives of the people of God. Move from here to the book of of first John and there to chapter three and verse eight. The one who practices sin is of the devil for the devil has sinned from the beginning. That's the individual who's practicing sin. The same as John chapter eight is committing sin. This person has not been delivered through Christ from sin. This individual is of the devil, because he has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God appeared for this purpose. Now, what's the purpose? To destroy the works of the devil. And that he did, as we read in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14, through his death. Through his death. So, God defeated sin. And he started at its very origin. He also spoke in the death of Christ to every aspect of the dimension of sin as it is defined in Scripture. Christ, in his death, died for our sins, our transgressions, and the iniquities thereof. And those are all communicated at various places, but all brought together in the Old Testament in the book of Isaiah and there in chapter 53. And I'll ask you to go there with me this morning. Chapter 53 of Isaiah. You remember that Scripture has defined sin using three words. There's many different ways sin is described in Scripture. But in particular, it has these three words associated with it. First, sin, which means to come short of. And in particular, as the text tells us in Romans, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The next word that's used is transgression. And that means to violate God's word. To come short is to miss the mark of God's holiness. That's the word sin. Transgression speaks to violate his law. The word iniquity comes from a Hebrew word that means twisted or perverted. And those three coming short, violating God's law, and the perversion thereof all communicate the character 
of sin in defining it. It is defined. And notice in Isaiah 53 what happens here. First of all, I'll ask you to, we'll just keep going in the same order of words, but jump to verse 12. This text in Isaiah 53 is a description of God's sacrifice in Christ. It is the explanation in specific practical words of what happened as Paul recorded it in Romans chapter 8, verse 3. God did sending his only son, his son, in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. Verse 12, notice the text. Verse 12 says, Therefore I will allot him, that is, the Lord Jesus, a portion with the great, and he will divide the booty with the strong, because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. We'll come back to that. Yet he himself bore the sin of many and interceded for the transgressors. He bore the sin. He took it upon himself, as Second Corinthians says, 5 says, he who knew no sin was made to be sin. He bore our sin. Take a look at verse 5. Verse 5 says, but he, that is Christ, was pierced through for what? Our transgressions. Transgressions, again, appears twice, as we just read in verse 12. And iniquity is mentioned in this chapter as well. Look at verse 5 again. He was crushed in the middle of the verse, therefore our iniquities. He was crushed for our iniquities. Move from there to verse 6. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, but the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. God in Christ taking care of every aspect of the way he defines sin, defeating it on every level, at every point. Iniquity is mentioned again in verse 11. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied by, the right, by his knowledge, the righteous one. My servant will justify the many, as he will bear their iniquities. All of it wrapped up in Christ. All of sin, every facet of it, the coming short, the violation of God's law, and the perversion of it all, condemned in Jesus Christ through his death on the cross. Well, sin, as we saw, is also directional. As David said, against you, and you only have I sinned, sin is directional. It's against God. But what has Christ done in his death? In condemning sin, we have forgiveness of sin. All the sins that have committed, been committed against God by the people of God are forgiven in Jesus Christ. The forgiven in Christ. What a great blessing that is. Look in Acts chapter 26, verse 28. Acts 26, 28. Connection. It's verse 18, excuse me. To open their eyes, God speaking, Paul speaking about what Christ sent him to do. To open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the dominion of Satan to God, that they may receive what? Forgiveness of sins. Forgiveness of sin. Ephesians chapter 1 makes it very clear. Look at verse 7. Ephesians 1 and 7. In him we have redemption through his blood, that is through his death on the cross, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches 
of his grace. Psalm 103, verse 3, as we read this morning, talks about our sins being forgiven as far as the east is from the west. What a praise that is. Hezekiah in the book of Isaiah mentioned that his sin had been cast by God behind God. In other words, God wasn't looking on him as his sinful state. God had cast his sinful state behind him, behind himself. What a praise. Micah 7, 19 speaks of the sins of God's people being cast into the sea. We have forgiveness of our sin. Jeremiah 31, 34 and Hebrews 8, 12 both speak to the forgiveness of sin. In the death of Christ, the condemnation in that death of sin, God's people have forgiveness. Sin is diffusive, as we saw. And what does the text tell us again here in Romans chapter 8? It tells us in verse 3 that Christ condemns sin in the flesh of sinful men is the significance of that verse. And on the basis of Christ's death, if anyone is in Christ, According to 2 Corinthians 5.17, that person has a new nature. What a praise. Sin is divisive. It separates us from God at the same time in the death of Christ. <clears throat> As 2 Corinthians 5.18 says, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Look at Colossians chapter 1 and verse 22. Yet he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. What a praise and what a blessing. We've been reconciled through Christ's death. Sin is domineering. Whenever you go back to Hebrews 2, and I'll ask you to do that and move again to verse 14, notice this. Hebrews 2 and 14, speaking of the defeat of Satan, the text says in verse 15, go to 14, Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same, that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and might free those who have through fear, who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. He freed us. He freed us. Look at Romans again, and there to chapter six. Romans six, a powerful text on the liberation from the bondage of sin. For the people of God by the death of Christ. Look at verse 6. Romans 6, 6. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. That's why preceding this, he said in verse 1, What shall we say? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? Verse 2 says, May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? How is it going to happen? You can't live in it if you're a believer. You're not under its dominion any longer. That doesn't mean it's not present. It doesn't mean you don't sin. But it does mean that sin is not your master any longer. As verse 4 says in Romans 8, that we might walk in righteousness through the work of the Holy Spirit within us. 
Sin's deceitful. Sin is deceitful. What we just read a moment ago in Acts 26, verse 18, that one of the reasons that Christ sent Paul was to open the eyes of the Gentiles so that you could see sin for what it really is. That you can see it in all of its demented form. All dimensions of it spread out on the canvas. So there's no mistaking the fact that it is diabolical. It is against God. It permeates everything. It's divisive, domineering, deceitful, destructive, and ultimately damning. Only the Christian can see that because only their eyes have been opened. Why? Because they are in Christ. And Christ, in his own words, is the truth. I am the way. I am the truth, he said. I am the light. Sin's destructive. Sin's destructive. But we know, as we have seen right here in Romans, if you're still in 6, look at verse 4. Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we will also be, or also be in the likeness of his resurrection. There is a day of resurrection according to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. A day wherein all of us who are Christians will be raised. And in that resurrection will be demonstrated the defeat of sin. Look in your Bibles with me to 2 Corinthians for a moment. Or 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Verse 54 says, or verse 53 says, For this perishable, that is, this body that you are in now, must put on the imperishable, that is, the immortal body, and this mortal must put on immortality. Verse 54 of 1 Corinthians 15 says, But when this perishable will have put on the imperishable, and this mortal will have put on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up. In victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And finally, as Romans 6 says, For the wages of sin is death, the rest of the verse says, But the gift of God is eternal life. It's eternal life. In what? In Christ Jesus. Back to Romans 8.1. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Delivered from sin's penalty. From that damning aspect of it. That of being cast into the lake of fire that burns forever and ever. Listen. What the law could not do, God did. He condemned sin in the flesh. How did he do it? Through his son, Jesus Christ. And that's the only way a person can be forgiven. That's it. He is it. That's why in Acts chapter 4, verse 12, the text says that there is no other name given under heaven among men by which we must be saved. And that name is Jesus Christ. As Paul wrote to the church at Corinth in chapter 3, verse 11, he said that there is no other foundation that can be laid but that which has been laid, which is Christ Jesus. No one's works will save them. No religion, as far as the world's religions are concerned, will save them. 
No worldly leader will save them from sin. All of those things are crafted by sin and are subject to sin. They cannot bring deliverance from it. They cannot defeat it. They cannot destroy it. They cannot affect sin except to promote it, to live it, and eventually be consumed and destroyed by it. But God did. He condemns sin in Christ's death on the cross. All who call on him, that is, on Christ, will be saved. Stand with me this morning. We have taken in just under this hour and condensed the great work of redemption into succinct statements taken from Scripture. That is the real entire message of Scripture is redemption. And ultimately, that for the glory of God, to the praise of His goodness and glory. You'll see it all through the Bible, all pointing to Christ, all summed up in Him. What a praise that is. What a blessing it is. The biblical exhortation is to believe in Christ. To trust Him. To acknowledge that God in Christ has judged Christ in the place of sinful humanity. And all who call on him will be saved. What a praise. What a blessing. Father in heaven, thank you. Thank you, thank you. That all whose eyes you open, you will open them. To see the magnitude of their sin, but the magnificent glory of the sin bearer. That their eyes are open to behold Christ. And they, by virtue of your grace on them, will call out to him and know the salvation of him. Thank you that you condemn sin in the flesh of Jesus Christ, who gave himself as an offering for sin on behalf of your people. In his name we pray.